Yeah, man. Sub up, purples. I hope you're doing good out there. Today is going to be a very special episode, may I say. Sort of a mini documentary of sorts about this honey right here. The Amiga 500. Before we get into it, I want to give a very special thank you to my dealer, Ashkan and Johi. Without you guys, this episode would not be possible. I was hunting for these samplers and the machine itself, and you guys made it possible. So big up yourself and the viewers. Enjoy this because it's about to get pretty nerdy, you know what I'm saying? All right, check them out. The year is 1987. Michael Esner, CEO of Disney, and Jacques Chirac, then Prime Minister of France, decide to build Disneyland Paris. Some idiot decides to spend $1.6 million looking for Nessie, with no evidence revealed, Prozac becomes the favorite drug of Americans. And on the big screen, you can catch movies such as Beverly Hills Cop 2, Lethal Weapon, Robocop, and Police Cop Detective. The British phonographic industry were naively trying to stop piracy with their campaign Home Taping is Killing Music at the time. But regardless of that, in the freestyles of many a people, you could find Michael Jackson's bad, Janet Jackson's Let's Wait a While, and my favorite Los Lobos single La Bamba. 1987 was also a breakthrough year in hip hop, seeing Eric B and Rakim release their debut album Paid in Full, Public Enemy sending their first political shock with Yo Bum Rush the Show, and both the Fat Boys and the Skinny Boys dropping albums to name a few. Average body mass boys were still struggling to get their first single, Healthy and Content, off the ground. All three were signed to BMI, ironically. Technology-wise, in the music industry, there was a lot of interesting stuff happening too. The SP-1200 by Emu was released, something I find extra interesting because the digital to analog converters at the time did have a kind of a similar sound, much due to where the technology was at at the time. Another radical sampler that you might have heard of is the Studio 440, the granddaddy of sequencing and sampling drum and music production machines. In the synthesizers world, everybody that was badass enough went out and got themselves a Yamaha SHS-10 keytar. Then came the star of today's show, the mighty, magnificent, amazing, Amiga 500, released by Commodore. The Amiga 500 was seen as a spiritual predecessor to the Commodore 64, even though Commodore had little to do with the development of it. Codenamed Rock Lobster, it looks a lot like the Commodore 128, but it's uh, not really the same at all. For a consumer level, multimedia computer ordinator device at the time, it was nothing short of a technological marvel. 7 megahertz microprocessor, displaying up to 32 colors at 320 by 200 pixels, or up to 16 colors at a staggering 640 by 400. A default 512 kilobytes of RAM, upgradable to an entire megabyte using its trapdoor expansion port, and of utmost importance, the sound chip named Paula, which I'll get back to in a minute. Commodore were pretty much genius when it came to the marketing of the Amiga 500, following the same success recipe of the Commodore 64. They sold it at a very low price point without a monitor, and they also sold it in toy stores and other stores providing electronics and not just in computer only dedicated stores because they marketed it just as much as a gaming console as anything else. So the idea was pretty much, here's a computer that anybody can get, you can play games on it, do your office applications, spreadsheets, word processing, put special effects on your home videos with it, make music on it, and I have no idea what the f this guy is doing obviously one too many Prozacs and that dude but on the music side of things its direct competitor the Atari 520 ST kind of won 
sport definitely won that competition, at least in professional settings, because you know because why? Because it had built-in MIDI ports and they marketed it way better toward musicians. That being said, the Amiga did get its unique music scene built around it. But it first and foremost ended up being a great gaming computer, seeing maximum success, especially in Europe. Some of the more notable games being Lemmings, Speedball 2, Another World, Shadow of the Beast, Turrican 2, just heaps and heaps of classics on that machine. And it's also through these games that the music scene sprung out. First of all, the music in many of these games were just great. Second of all, there was that thing called piracy. Don't copy that floppy, so let me break this down for you. Don't copy that floppy, remember? So when these pimply teenagers were sitting in their basements, cracking code to get the latest releases out, sharing them on BBS forums, accumulating massive amounts of street cred, of course, they wanted to put their stamp on it. So they would make these demos that would play before the actual cracked game would start up. Pushing the computer to its limits and making it do things that it perceivably wasn't supposed to be able to do. So these demo groups, as we call them, would get competitive with it. Sometimes friendly, sometimes more on a matter of life and death, to see who could crack the latest games first who could make the best graphics, who could make the dopest music, often sending shout outs and messages across in their demos. And many of these amazingly talented purples actually got their career started making these demos. I just find that entire culture to be extremely fascinating. You could even buy mixtape floppies with these music files or mods, short for modules, through postal order in magazines. And soon enough, there was enough interest around it for some proper music creation tools to be developed for it. Before we talk about these tools, let's go back to the sound chip on the Amiga 500, the sexy Paula. Paula was designed by Paul Keller and named after his girlfriend, Paula. Let's pause, please. Can Paul be perceived polygamous since Paul and Paula pollinated and Paul played Paula? <laughs> Appalling. No more party pooping. Paula is able to generate four PCM voices at the same time at 8 bits sampling depth resolution at a frequency rate up to 27, 28 kilohertz. Two of these voices are hard panned left and two are hard panned right. Why? My guess is it was a goddamn goof. Simple language, it can play four samples at a time, two for each ear. So radical. To actually sample into the Amiga, you need something fancy like this. This one can switch between line or mic signal and sample in mono or stereo. And it's also got separate gain knobs for the left and right channel. Plug in your eighth inch stereo cable in the back of the sampler and the sampler plugs into the serial and parallel ports in the back of the Amiga. Let's give it a whirl. To make us some sweet music on the Amiga, we need some software for it too. I'm using ProTracker 2.3D, which is preferred among the Amiga's musicians, you know what I'm saying? It might look scary if you're not familiar with Tracker software, but it's really not that complicated. You trigger notes and the pattern moves vertically. So to the very left, you can see a bunch of different notes and the numbers in the column next to the note tells it which sample to play and how to manipulate it. In this case, I'm telling it which position of a drum break to play back to get that jungle-tastic sample chopping. <laughs> you can actually sample directly into ProTracker. Not all trackers can do that. Sometimes you need a separate software for it. But it's pretty simple. You can monitor the sample like this. You see the beautiful sound wave right there. We initiate the sampling, the screen goes blank. That, that is, is all right. right! You can navigate using the arrow keys and the letters act sort of like the, a virtual keyboard, sort of like an Ableton Live or FL Studio. And then you, of course, you have this badass mouse at your disposal. So you either punch the notes in one by one or live, and you can also plug in a MIDI interface such as this one. And then it turns out a little something like this.
I decided to modernize it a little bit and then install this floppy drive emulator. So this means I can plug a USB drive in there and basically have tons of virtual floppy disks and not have to worry so much about the dying double-sided double-density disks and that. Let's listen to the aliasing crunch. That's basically the reason I'm so in love with this. I'm just gonna shut up and let you enjoy this. Be beautiful. Can it boom bap though? Yes it can. And it's also got a filter that applies to all the sounds at the same time when you turn it on. Have a listen. That was just about it for today. Do you have any Amiga 500 memories? Or are you looking to make some? Let me know in the comments below. Please subscribe, ring the notification bell, hit that like, and uh, consider supporting me on Patreon if you really enjoy this shit right here. Okay, bye-bye.